What's going on, everybody? Your man, Eric Wilson, in for the Sports Arena. First Sports Arena Monday night in the month of October. We got so much to talk about, and predominantly, as you know, it's going to be all about the NFL. Let me go ahead and get the crew in here this evening, as I do each and every Monday and Wednesday night. Of course, I got to get this man in. He's been filling in for us. Man, I'm so thankful that he's been joining us. Like I said, this brother does pretty much everything. He does the Gauntlet podcast. He does Basket Bros. He does Cub Fidential. You might find him on a couple other shows, and he's here with us on the sports arena. Our man Danzel is back in the building. Good evening, sir. What's up, brother? What's going on, man? Thanks for bringing me back. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. Man, love having you on. Um, I have to apologize, as I always do each and every week, because bringing this man on, you know he's going to spend the majority of his time trying to somehow weave in the fact that his Miami Dolphins are arguably one of the best teams in the AFC. Let me get Blue Hawks 13 in the building. My man, sideline sports home, Mr. John Shear. Good evening, John. Not one of the best, the best team okay, in the AFC. Go, they John, already beat not, the Bills and Ravens, so John. wipe them out. I'm not going that far with you tonight. You ain't going to do this to me tonight. You're not going to do it to me tonight. Not tonight. I wonder who you're you know why, John? Performer. You know why? Because I'm 4-0, and John, and you're not. Don't think I – hey, can I have okay. a prime performer as a team, or does it have to be a person? You mean our peak performer of the peak week, John? Performer. Is that what you are referring to? <laughs> God, you can't even get the topics right. Just for that – you got 10 seconds of off screen. Can't even get the topics right. Dude, we put him in timeout too. Oh, wow. That's a that's record time for timeout. Because come he on, man. We, we put a rundown out each and every time we do the sports arena. Okay. <laughs> and this is a brand new segment that we're doing. Shout out to our man Ray Lynn, who is enjoying time with his family on a beautiful cruise, man. But you know, we all take time and invest in what we do. John Shear peak performer for week four let's peak start performer. with you sir who is your peak performer am for i allowed four? to pick a team or can it be a player just just, just, just go well, i'm asking go. it matters all right so my what context? peak prime performer whatever you want to call it it has to be the philadelphia eagles okay you go down 14 nothing you get punched in the mouth in the rain at home against the Jags, an up-and-coming team. It, you throw a pick six. Everything's going wrong. Jags go up 14 nothing, And you somehow come back. Now, I get Trevor Lawrence dropped four balls in the rain, and I'm not going to knock him for that because, I mean, we all saw what the weather was like. It was terrible. But you get punched in the mouth as the Philadelphia Eagles at home, 14 nothing, throw a pick six, and you still come back all the way back on the Jags and you don't let that stop you. Jalen Hurts doesn't fumble the ball four times, even though Trevor Lawrence did. They're playing in the same weather, and the Eagles run the ball really well, and they come back and they punch the Jags right in the mouth. I mean, that's got to be my peak performer of the week is, is the Eagles. You know, it, it's like Mike always says, you know, you find out who somebody is. You don't know who somebody is until they get punched in the mouth. Well, found out what the Eagles are. They got punched in the mouth, and, you know, they, they're just like, yeah, yeah, like that's all you got. So you know, I was very impressed by the Eagles at home in the in the pouring down rain. Kind of remind me of when Lashawn McCoy ran all over the Lions in the snow. You know that type of weather game where it was just one of those that you really remember those weather games. So that was mine. Fair enough, Denzel. Who's your peak performer for Week Four? So I'm gonna go a little uh, unconventional here, and I've been waiting for this brother to be back and stay back as long as he stays healthy. My peak performer was Giants running back Saquon Barkley. He had 31 carries for 146 yards. He averaged 4.7 yards per clip. He also had two receptions for 16 yards, including an amazing catch and run, which should have been a loss of about seven to ten yards. And he spun out and made something out of nothing. He didn't reach the end zone, but his plays did set up uh, two Daniel Jones touchdown rushes. They won 20-12 uh, to 12 versus Chicago. They're 3-1. There's still a lot of football left to be played, but uh, they are adding strength to the NFC East as we speak. Do I expect them to win a division? No. But I was talking with JB uh, actually last night, and I told him, you know, if they so happen to get eight games, you know, they it'd be a big step for them. 
But Saquon Barkley, I mean, here's to him. As long as he stays healthy, I think you're going to get this kind of production out of him, much like his first two years in the league. So that's my peak performer of week four. It's fair. I can appreciate that. I'm going to stay in the running back position and say, finally, Josh Jacobs has shown up Yes. to the Las Vegas Raiders. I mean, 28 for 144, two touchdowns. Five receptions on top of that. He was an actual dual threat in their first win against the Denver Broncos yesterday. Josh Jacobs, welcome back, my brother. Please be consistent because I want to believe in the Raiders. You're sitting at one and three. I hope this was the horse that gets this motor running and gets this team to begin to start clicking on all the cylinders. But I was truly concerned. But the fact that Josh Jacobs said, I'm your RB1. Let me run through this Broncos defense. Let me show you what I can do if you throw me the ball as well. Josh Jacobs, sir, you are my peak performer for week four. Thank goodness. <laughs> and when we do Alex Fleming's NFL carousel this week, shameless plug, me and Phil Jones going to have a nice chat about this team and what he saw because I truly, like I said, I hope, I want this to be the start of something good for this Vegas Raiders team because in my estimation, that division, as opposed to the NFC East, is truly up for grabs. The NFC East is looking like y'all can't call us the least anymore, okay? I'm going to say that right you now. say FC West really up for grabs, Eric? Really? Kansas City is going to do what Kansas City does. I still have faith in the Chargers and the Raiders. And at some point, John, we truly, I think by the middle of the season, we'll know who the Denver Broncos are. Right. That's fair. I, I, I just don't see it with Hackett. I don't see it at, at all. I see absolutely nothing from him. You lose to a team that it was the last winless team in the NFL. You lay an egg. I just don't see it. You have a running back in Melvin Gordon who every single time he gets to the goal line and has a big carry, what does he do? Coughs it up. Like mm-hmm. I, I cannot trust Denver. And I certainly don't trust the Raiders. I mean, look at Derek Carr. He was terrible in that game. He was terrible. Like, they, they won in spite of him, not because of him. Like, I don't trust either of those teams. The Chargers didn't look great against the Texans. They should have mopped the floor with the Texans. They didn't look great. Like, the Chiefs are the only ones that are playing really well in that division. Everybody else is suspect right now. I mean, Bosa's going to be out for forever for them, So for the Chargers. So, like, I, I just don't trust anybody right now. The Chiefs are the only one that are playing well. They went and waxed Tampa Bay, even though the score was closer than it looked, they waxed Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay wasn't even close to them last night. So Chiefs are the only team that has looked good. Everybody else has been suspect. Raiders got to win because the Broncos are, I mean, the Broncos only wins were, were against what? I mean, like they lost to Seattle and, and they beat Houston. They beat us. Like, I mean, the Broncos haven't really beat anybody either. I, I'm just saying like that division only the Chiefs have played well. Everybody else has been in. Eh. And while I agree with your assessment, John, what I'm saying to you is this. We know at some point, and I think October is a very telling month. You know, we use the terminology for the MLB as they begin the postseason. You can't script October. And I think that also applies to the NFL, especially in a month where we're going to see now that the rust is off, if you will. Because three preseason games, listen, it doesn't get the job done. It takes a few weeks into the regular season for us to really see what these teams are going to be doing. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, Philly off to a great start, and we'll we'll get to them in a moment, is, is one thing. But the expectation is this was supposed to be the toughest division. Well, everybody finally has at least one win. And, you know, some of this may have been divisional play. And didn't we say in our preseason that these teams were going to beat up on each other when it came to divisional playoffs? If yeah. you if you take care of that now, you're going to be battle-tested as the season progresses. Now, listen, when you get to the back end of the season, 
and you have more of those divisional matchups, mm-hmm. then we're going to see, are you able to withstand? Now, with uh, you saying October, and I totally get, um, you know, with, with your assessment of October, me personally, I feel like December is the crucial month because this is the time period when the eight and four teams around that area, uh, oh, there he is, uh, that, that's when they got to close it out. You know what I mean? Uh, because it is later on, just like you said. Oh, I thought that was when, Mike. Oh, that's Reggie. Oh, oh okay. Hey, there gentlemen, is. welcome to co-host of the this show. This great, brother's on a cruise, and he cruise. still finds time no. to jump in. Hey. Sir, you was not supposed to bring me in. I was just supposed to be looking from the back. Now my wife looking like, I know you not. I'm not finna <laughs> be on the show. God, I know. Love. I just wanted to watch from the back. That's what I'm finna do, man. Okay, he watching from the back. We got our man in the back just hanging out, chilling with us. Mm, You got him in trouble. I didn't touch the button. I didn't put him in the show. I I swear I didn't touch it. (laughs) He brought himself in. That's what he did. He he tried to put it on us. (laughs) Tried to put it on us. But uh, what was I saying? But yeah, the uh, the, I've always felt like it's been December because we have seen teams who have started out, you know. Eight and four, and then they go on that skid. I've watched a six and zero oh Minnesota team miss the postseason in two thousand and three. You know, this is the time period because, like you said, you got those divisional games down the stretch, and some of them they're games you're supposed to win. So I've always felt like it's always been December because that's the close. That's closing the season yeah, out. But I, think the what, I think what Eric is is trying to say is like. The rust is off, so like the excuse mm-hmm. that you may have had of there's no preseason, you don't hit each other in the off season, so you're finally getting your first taste of actually hitting each other week one. So this right. first couple of weeks, it's like preseason, even though it counts. It's it's everybody's kind of rusty. So October, you really don't have those ex- that type of excuse anymore. It's like everybody's got the rust off. Three four weeks in, okay, like it's go time. There's no more of that. You know what I mean? But players are off the pup list after four weeks. Like a lot of players come off that pup list. You start to get those important pieces back. Like the Dolphins get Byron Jones back. Brian Robinson's going to come back for the commanders soon. So like pieces like that start to help teams. Davis White might come back soon for the Bills. Important players come off the pup list and it starts to change the dynamic of these week five, six, seven, eight matchups because you didn't have those guys week one through four. Mm-hmm. So exactly. Yeah. You're right. And I, mm-hmm. and Denzel, to your point, and I'll close it out by saying this. I do agree with you. To me, gut check time is the week before Thanksgiving. That, to me, is gut check time. From the third week of November all the way till the end of the season is gut check time. If you are 500 or below, you have to figure out how are we going to write this ship. If you are above 500, you need to remain consistent because we'll take the Pittsburgh Steelers from a couple of years ago. Started the season 11 and 0, then lost the next five. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they were one and done in the playoffs. Yes, they were. Yeah, they were. Clearly. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's one of those things where I appreciate what teams are doing now. But this month, I think, is going to be telling because of what didn't happen in the preseason. Sure. Speaking of the Pittsburgh Steelers, I never thought in my entire time of doing the sports arena or just doing a show in general, we would be having this particular conversation. If I was to tell you gentlemen that Mike Tomlin, the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers and Bill Belichick, the head coach of the new England Patriots were both one and three at the, at the end of September, Yada looked at me like I had four heads and did not know what the heck was going on. But that is where we stand right now. So the question is, John Shear, who's been the more disappointing coach, in your opinion? I think it has to be, I think it has to be Belichick. I mean, after all you did with Tom Brady, the six Super Bowls, and... You've done nothing after you got after you lost Brady. Like you've done nothing. Yeah, you made the playoffs last year, but again, I've said it time and time again that that was more of a fluke. You know, there was a lot of a lot of things that had to bounce your way to get into the playoffs. Like that was one of those where it was like you got in, yeah, congratulations, but you're not getting in next year. Like 
they're basically the same team. They've lost some pieces, but like it's not the same this year. It, it's hard to repeat what they did last year, and the AFC is a lot better. So if the AFC got a lot better. Why aren't you able to compete? Is it because the competition got better and you just weren't that good? Or Mac Jones just isn't that good? Or Bill Belichick just didn't build that good of a roster and we give him too much of the benefit of the doubt? I think it's that. It's not. I'm not knocking Bill Belichick as a coach, but he is also kind of sort of the GM. He, he made this choice to have Matt Patricia and Joe Judge as co-offensive coordinators. Or, or he didn't call it offensive coordinators, but they are co-offensive coordinators. I don't. I just don't like what Bill Belichick has done post Brady. I don't like any of it. Mike Tomlin. It, I mean, he has more of an excuse to me because I mean, you're working with Mitch Trubisky. You're you're transitioning from Ben Roethlisberger, drafted Kenny Pickett, so you have that bridge. What was supposed to be Trubisky until Kenny Pickett was ready, and as we saw, that bridge that bridge burned up. So Kenny Pickett had to come and save the day. Now he didn't quite do it, but I think Kenny Pickett's going to be fine. I think he's going to be fine in that offense. And I think he's going to instill a lot of life into them. Um, they might not make the playoffs, but I think they'll be a lot better than what they've been to start. It can't be much worse than what Mitch Trubisky's been. He has no gripe, you know, and he comes to like complaining about not getting the job. Like, so I think the the Patriots, I mean, they're just going to continue to be a disaster. I mean, the Steelers will be fine. They'll get T.J. Watt back eventually, and I think Pickett will give them a lot of energy. So I think it has to be Bill Belichick to make a Mike Caradonudo long story short. <laughs> so we got a question from our man, John Mizak. Are the Pats open for Cam's return? Can and I, I think that's this? a question. I, I think that's a question I think we all can answer based on the fact that their third-string quarterback came in yesterday mm-hmm and took Aaron Rodgers and that Packers defense to overtime. So uh, let yep. me get Denzel's thoughts on who's the more disappointing coach. I'll give my take, and then we'll come back to John Mizak's question, and we'll answer it. Okay. Um, I got to go with uh, John Sher on this one. The di- most disappointing is Belichick. You know, this is someone who has been hailed as the GOAT of all head coaches, and being a defensive uh, mind that you are, you currently hold a 14th-ranked defense. You're about middle of the pack. The defense is allowing 174 rush yards per game and 308 passing yards per game. So as you can see, teams are pretty much doing at will what they want at will to with the Patriots defense. You know, then on top of that, you know, he's been known for doing the most with so little. Then there's the whole Brady versus Belichick thing. I mean, I, I'm not ready to throw a towel in on him yet because of yesterday, because we saw a youngster get in there and slug it out. Sure, he only threw for 99 yards, but he did keep him in the game. He did get them to overtime, you know. Um, I'm, you know, Belichick, you know, you, you expect we're, – we're, maybe we're spoiled as football fans, and we expect so much from Bill, from Bill Belichick that we forget that, you know, the man is human. And with that being said, and – I, my apologies. You know what I mean? I, I, I just had to get y'all's thoughts on this. What if it's bigger than Tomlin and, and Belichick? What if we are witnessing the beginning of the end? What if we are witnessing a changing of the guard, the phasing out of the old guard? Interesting question. Give me, you know what? I need 20 seconds to show love to all the shows on our network. And I need to marinate on that. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the sports room. You man, Eric Wilson, alongside my brother Denzel Snipes from the Sideline Sports Network family. And, of course, my man, Blue Hawk 13, John Shear, Sideline Sports, every Tuesday at 830. Make sure you check him out. Uh, Denzel's on all the shows. Basket Bros, The Gauntlet. He's on Confidential. Brother's doing so much, and he is gracious enough to join us here on the sports arena. So we were talking about Belichick. We were talking about Tomlin, who's been the more disappointing coach, and that Denzel brought up an excellent conversations now we got two questions to dive into here tonight gentlemen my take is i'm I'm actually going to side against you guys and i'm going to go with mike tomlin and my reason being is because tomlin has weapons 
at the wide receiver position. And I still believe in Najee Harris. Now, we know T.J. Watt being out does add a component on the defensive side of the ball. But when he comes back, I think that Pittsburgh team is going to be who we need them to be. But right now, they're just not – the expectation of who this team is is just not there. And for Mike Tomlin to say he felt that the team needed a bit of a spark, which is why he made the transition from Trubisky to the rookie, Kenny Pickett, what that says to me is I think he he listened a little too much – to the people. Now, mm-hmm. I, now, normally it's not a bad thing. It really isn't. But you're the head coach. You're the one who ultimately makes these decisions. And now there's no turning back. So regardless of what Kenny Pickett does for the rest of this season, he's your guy. Okay? Now, my hope is that once T.J. Watt gets back, Najee Harris figures things out, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, that whole entire uh, uh, with George Pickums, when, when they actually finally get themselves together, they're going to be the team that we expect them to be. But I just feel like Tomlin, I don't want to say he made a knee-jerk reaction, but I hope it doesn't come to bite him in the butt. That's what I'll say, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Let's keep it going because now we got two questions. First, let's answer our man John Mizak's question is, are the Pats open for Cam's return? And, John, you want to go, so I'll let you take that one. Sir. Yeah, I, I just want to say first before I answer this question, how amazing it is to have John Isaac back in the comments. Love this guy. Forever part of this f- sideline sports family. I'm so happy he's back in our comment section. One of the brightest football minds I've ever had the chance to talk to. So absolute honor to have him back in our comment section. Love it. Um, no, no, it was an absolute disaster when, when the, I'm not, I'm not going dolphins. I'm just telling you the dolphins ended cam. Like that was cam's career right there. The worst quarterback rating in the history of the NFL for anybody in a game, starting in a game was cam Newton against the dolphins right then. And there was when I was like, okay, cam's done. Like that was to me, the game where I was like, cam just doesn't have it anymore. When he played that game for the Panthers and the dolphins absolutely demolished him. I was like, cam just, I mean, the injuries have caught up to him. And I just, I think it's going to be much of the same. What we saw in Carolina in his second stint, it was a disaster. And I think no matter where he goes, like the injuries have caught up to the guy. Like, let's let this guy go and retire. He's not going to the Hall of Fame, but he had a pretty good career. He had one magical season. He just, the injuries are caught up. He doesn't have it anymore. And and that's part of sports. So no, no, the Pats should not be open for Cam's return. All right. I'm going to say really quick, John, I agree with you at this. I think I think Cam Newton, from my estimation and from what I've seen, I believe he is done with the NFL. I don't think that I don't think he wants to come back. I what I hope is. You know, he doesn't try to come back to resurrect whatever he's got left in the tank. Because he's always won on, on any of the podcasts that he's on. He still says he's better than not 32, but he's better. He He's in that middle tier or even top echelon of quarterbacks. He always says that, and I don't believe that to be the case anymore. So Denzel, really quick, I'll go to you, sir, and then we got we, we to gotta keep it moving. As I knew this was going to happen with the three of us, listen, we don't need <laughs> Mike. We got this covered. You're, you're muted, bro. There you go. We got you. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it, it, it could be over. It, it could be over for Cam Newton. Um, I think at this time period, the game has passed him up. You know, we're in a new era. You got the um, you got the the Josh Allen's, you got the Lamars out there, you got the Pat Mahomeses and everything. Um, they are doing well more so what he was doing, like even back when he had his MVP campaign. And to say that he's like as good as them right now, like I get the mind frame. You know, but keep in mind, you know, like, you know, these guys are are miles younger than him. And, you know, as a human being, your mind plays you sometimes because your mind will tell you you can do it. But then your body could, you know, because of age. Right. You know, he's your body completion percent for his career. He's like a 60 percent guy. Most of those guys are like 65, 66. Big difference. Exactly. You know what I mean? And and he had accuracy problems early in his career. You know, completion percentage hadn't exactly been his best friend. So for him to come back now and say he's just as good, I mean, I'm going to doubt that. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, it would be an awesome 
comeback story if he did come back and even did halfway decent. But at this point, I'm not sold. All right. So let's get to your question, Denzel. Are we seeing are we seeing the beginning of the end for some of these historic head coaches who have, you know, coached decades? And my answer is they would be the start of that because you, you got to figure you still got Andy Reid. You mm-hmm. still got Pete Carroll. Uh, you know, Lovey Smith has been in and out of the league, but he is still an out a head coach. So yes. I throw him in the mix. You know, um, I'll say I'll say I, I want to wait till the end of the season or at least three quarters of the way through the season. I want to come back to this conversation maybe in, like I said earlier, maybe in November, December. Let's see where the Steelers and the Patriots are at record-wise. Right. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. As a wise man once said to me before, and I love using this, it's not impossible. But for me right now, it's improbable. I just don't Mm. see it yet. John, what do you think? Yeah, I I mean, I agree with you on that. If if we're going by... I mean, Bill Belichick chose his, like he chose all of these players. Like it's not like Tomlin's a GM. Bill Belichick is the head coach and the GM. He chose Aguilar. He chose Hunter Henry. He chose John U. Smith. Like he handcrafted this offense. He got Mac Jones. Like he got all the guys that he wanted, but it was just terrible decisions. Like, I don't think Mac Jones is very good. I don't think John U. Smith is very good. I don't think, I mean, I think Hunter Henry is, but he's, I don't think he's in a very good system. Um, Nelson Aguilar, we know he's got, you know, hands of stone, like Kendrick Bourne. Like, why are you signing Kendrick Bourne and Nelson Aguilar and John U. Smith? Like the Bill Belichick chose all those guys. That's on him. It's not not like Tomlin drafted these guys. Like there's a GM, you know, a very good GM in in Pittsburgh that had obviously a lot of good drafts. Just they don't really have an offensive line. And I think Kenny Pickett can potentially overcome some of those offensive line issues. He's going to be better than Mitch Trubisky, that's for sure. I don't think I don't think anybody can be as bad as he was. He he mustered like a touchdown in a couple games. Like it's just not good. So. I think I give Tomlin the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not going to knock Belichick, though. Just, I mean, you lost Brady, but I'm not going to say, like, he's a bad coach or anything like that. But eventually your time comes, and, you know, maybe Belichick or maybe his time with the Patriots has come. Because I right. think he can still coach. Maybe he should go somewhere else. Hmm. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the film Rocky Balboa. You know, um, he came back to see if he still had it. And he's the old general, right? The old grizzled general. And while he did slug it out, he'll still slug it out with you. He still lost to the younger guy. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. Maybe it is a changing. We're going to revisit that conversation, but I love that question, Denzel. Appreciate it. Let's move on to another team and staying in the AFC. And I kind of wish we had our man, J.J. Jenkins, with us for this one because for the second time in three weeks – Baltimore has blown a fourth quarter lead. If I was to ask you gentlemen right now, and you have to give me a definitive answer, who's to blame for this? You asking me or him? Who do you want? Whoever. I got to go. I got to go hardball, man. I mean, like you can't keep going, making these stupid decisions, like going for it on fourth and one. When you take, I've, I say this every single time, take the points. Chiefs, Bengals, AFC Championship. What did I say? I said, take the points, Chiefs, at the half. I said, don't do this. Don't go for this. They went for it. Tyree Kill got stopped. They ended up losing. That field goal cost them the game. Like, not going for the field goal, going for the touchdown at the half. Like, take the points. I don't understand what the Ravens are doing. And John Harbaugh's explanation made it even worse, saying, well, we, you know, we thought that the best decision was to go for a touchdown. Like, yeah, going for a touchdown sounds nice, but if you can go up on the Bills late by three points, you do it and you force them to score. If they go down and get a touchdown, they go down and get a touchdown. If they get a field goal, it's a tie game. But I'd rather have the lead than take my chances on. I mean, and and if you're going to go for it on fourth and one, run with Lamar Jackson. That's his best attribute. Not passing the ball, run with him. Like, I don't understand what John Harbaugh is doing. I mean, 
I just don't get it. It's all got to fall on Harbaugh for me. If we're talking about guys that maybe have lost a step with in regards to coaching, you know, you guys maybe talk about Harbaugh a little bit because it's been a little bit disappointing for – actually, it's been disappointing for a while with, you know, with all these playoff losses. I know you had injuries last year, but they missed the playoffs, and then this year they're blowing leads. The defense is supposed to be revamped. I mean, Harbaugh gets quite the pass, and nobody talks about him. Mm, all right. Mm. Denzel, what's your, what's your take on this one, brother? Um, I mean, I, I do have to agree with uh, John Shear on, on his take. Um, I love that word. I will say – John Shear. <laughs> he only hears it once every 60 days. But um, Exactly. But, um, I mean, first and foremost, let me just get this out the way. If Lamar Jackson scores that touchdown, you know, hindsight's 20-20. If he scores that touchdown, and everyone will be talking about it. it's a gutsy call and – how uh, Jim and, and uh, John Harbaugh would be a hero and whatnot. Me personally, I would have taken the points, but that's situational. Overall, in the grand scheme, if I'm John Harbaugh, that defensive coordinator is in the hot seat. This is the second double digit blown lead in as many weeks, three to be exact. There should be no reason why the defense is playing on their heels, pinning their heels back, and letting these teams come back. I get it. The Bills are good. I get it. You know, the, the, the Dolphins say are it. up and coming. But ah, come on. You from, veered. You were going to say good. I, you veered. Oh, you almost I was in the, I was in the. I was in the middle of my, my two-page report, and here you come. <laughs> but, well, I uh, wanted it. I wanted you to finish that sentence. No matter if it's against my Texans or if you're facing the Chiefs, if you have a double-digit lead, you must close that door, period. Now, some people may say, oh, it was Lamar's fault. He didn't put up more points. Yeah, but at least Lamar had the lead. You know what I mean? So defense, particularly the defensive coordinator, this one's on you, at least in my opinion. So, Denzel, I love the way you go, my brother, because great minds think alike. Wink Martindale, Mike McDonald. I'm putting this squarely on the two of you because you gentlemen are the ones who are calling the plays for the defensive side of the Baltimore Ravens. To me, that it has nothing to do with John Harbaugh. This has nothing to do with Lamar Jackson. This has everything to do with your defense not being able to stop the three of us playing offense against mm -hmm. the Ravens defense. You could put 12 of Sideline Sports Network's own out there, That'd and we might even be able field. to score on the Baltimore defense. I ain't talking about Lamar, because Lamar going to do what he does. But at some point, that defense, a defense that when we think of the Ravens defense, we think of Ed Reed. We think of mm -hmm. Terrell Suggs. We think of Ray Lewis. You know, that defense was the reason that Trent Dilfer and Joe Flacco have rings. Yep. Okay? Yep. That's why. So I wish I could put it on the players, but they are being led by two gentlemen who know how to coach, but for these first four weeks can't seem to figure out how to coach. So I'm putting it squarely on them. And I really, I, I have to go with, you know, at some point, like we were saying earlier about Belichick and Tomlin, maybe it is time for a change at that particular coordinator position. Because, you know, listen, I always have love for the late, great, God rest his soul, Jim Johnson, what he was able to do with the Philadelphia Eagles defense. However, if it ever came to the point where Jim couldn't be Jim, you know people would have talked about it. I love okay? Jim Johnson, man. And I think the same thing could be said about Wink and Mike McDonald. Time will tell, but that's how I feel. All right? We're going to take another quick 20-second break because if you didn't see it first time, I got to make sure I always show love to the Sideline Sports <laughs> Network, the network that houses all of our shows. Be right back.
ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Sports Arena on a Monday night. Your man, Eric Wilson, alongside Blue Hawk 13, John Shear, and of course, our man, Denzel Snipes, joining us, part of the Sideline Sports Network family. All right, gentlemen, I'm not going to do a lot of talking on this. I'm going to let the two of you have this conversation. I might chime in a little bit here and there in case someone decides to get a little lippy, John Shear. Philadelphia Eagles are 4 0. Are they the NFC? favorite right now Denzel 4-0 Eagles NFC favorites as of right now yes now got more football left to be played but however they're looking good they're smoking as of right now uh for points for their fifth rank for points against the seventh rank you look at Jalen Hurts he's got a 66.7 percent completion percentage He's thrown for 1,120 yards. He's averaging 9.1 yards per attempt, so much for that he can't throw narrative. Now, he's got four touchdown passes. He's thrown two picks. Uh, one of them, I think both of them were actually tip balls. So he's he harboring a 99.6 passer rating. He's also got 205 rushing yards and four rushing touchdowns. You know, Hurts has really willed this team. They've gotten back to their running ways. I think Miles Sanders just cashed in in the end zone for the first time in like two seasons. The defense is playing angry. I said it before. I'll say it again. They are playing angry. They want the GOAT in the playoffs. That woke Jalen Hurts up. That whooping that he took at Tampa in the playoffs, that woke him up. And I know that they've got bigger goals. I get it. You know what I mean? But it's just something about beating Brady in the postseason. That's on his mind. And the whole team should feel that way. His command of the locker room this fast, I mean, like, like he 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 is quickly in, embodying that Philly culture. And I think that you know, the, he's most definitely got the locker room. He most definitely has the confidence of uh, his head coach. The Eagles are rolling. I really don't see anyone, you know, stopping them anytime soon. Me personally, I'm awaiting uh, Cowboys-Eagles because uh, that's going to be, you know, prompt, uh, showtime at the Apollo type business. But um, I say yes. As of right now, 4-0 Eagles, they would be the NFC favorites. No. Let's let's just stop this nonsense. I mean, congratulations, you beat what the Washington Commanders. Um, you know, you the Jags punch you in the mouth again. You know that was a nice comeback win. You beat the Lions. Like you know, you've had some nice wins against no name teams, but I mean, you really haven't played the Rams. You haven't played the Bucks. You you know what I mean? Like you haven't played teams like that. So let's just pump the brakes. Like you don't. You know, you're not going to play the Commanders in the playoffs or the Lions in the playoffs. Like, and you almost lost to the Lions. So, I mean, let's not forget that. So, let's just chill out and, and not go too crazy with the Eagles are the best team. Like, we all we all remember what Jalen Hurts was in the playoffs. So, still got to see it. We've only seen four games so far. So, it's just a couple games. It's only a month into the season. Let's chill out. Not even close to being the best team. Like, congratulations, you're four and Like, big whoop. You want a Super Bowl ring? Are you gonna build a statue for Jalen Hurts too? Now you know what? I want you to keep that same energy if y'all beat the Jets. If y'all beat the hapless Jets, I want you to keep that same energy. We ain't did nothing. It was only the Jets. I want to hear that from John Shear. We beat the Ravens and the Bills. <laughs> I. Thank you. No, you did. Get him no, out of no, here. You, you, no, you did. Out you did. Order. My point is, is they're winning the games they're supposed to win right now. Yeah, you know what? At some here. point, at some point, at some point, when is it going to be one consistent narrative? Because see, if you play a team that you should beat, if you beat them, well, it's, how can you oh, call well, them the best play team anybody. in the NFC when they're beating the Lions and the Commanders? Like, how can you be like, oh, well, they're the best team in the NFC? Like. What track John. record do they have John. besides beating the Lions and the Commanders? John. Like that, Hi, right John. now, John. I think it's a little bit silly to put First them off, on that pedestal. I think you need to understand something. The question was not, are they the best team? The question was, are they the NFC favorites right now? That no. was the question, John. I didn't say anything about the best team. Are they the NFC favorites? Right now, uh, that's the I question. I still say no. Okay, just I want to make sure you answer the question before no. I say what I got to say. 
Go for it. And I take everything into account, both of what you two gentlemen said here tonight. Now, listen, I have always said this, and I will continue to always say this. And please allow me to look into the camera when I say this so everybody knows what I'm talking about. I am by far one of the hardest critics when it comes to my Philadelphia Eagles. I love them each and every week. And they also give me so much acid reflux and indigestion. I have to get my prescription refilled probably the Monday after. However, this year, so far, whether it be against the Detroit Lions, whether it be against a divisional opponent in the Washington Commanders, whether it be a Monday night matchup against Kirk Cousins, who does not excel well, on, on prime time, or whether it be against our old head coach, the coach who won us a Super Bowl, and Trevor Lawrence. We did exactly what was required of us. It ain't got to be pretty. Ain't even got to be clean. But we got the W. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to be remembered. Now, John, listen, to all your points at the beginning of tonight here on the sports arena, yeah, we got punched in the mouth. A tip ball that turned into a pick six, and then another Trevor Lawrence touchdown, put it, putting them up 14 nothing on us. That's going to spawn a lot of criticism, and it's also going to spawn a lot of hatred towards our team, saying, oh, this team isn't who we thought they were. But see, then we come back and hang 29 on you, and you get one more touchdown in I guess you would kind of call it garbage time. But at that point, the game was over in my estimation. But please understand something. This is a team that is built differently. See, I want you to go back in time, John, to 2004. At one point when we had Donovan McNabb, we had Brian Westbrook, we had Terrell Owens. And then on the defensive side, I had Jeremiah Trotter, the Axe Man. Of course, I had B-Dog. I had Hugh Douglas and a bunch of other names. That's what this team reminds me of, John. This is a team that is about winning and doing by any means necessary what it takes to get the W. So I want you to continually have this different approach when it comes to my team. I really do. Because when we do succeed, when we do move forward, and when we do eventually get back to the promised land, should we be so fortunate enough to do it, I want you to remember this conversation. Because, yes, John, it is only four games. But I still say to you, only one team in the NFL is undefeated. And does that put a bigger target on our back? You're damn right it does. But if you're going to continually come into our house and punch us in the mouth, we're going to let you know where you're at. Well, now, when we go to your house and do it to you, that's on you. You let us do it. But when you come to the 215, when you come to the link, oh, we expect your best. But you leave it out of Lincoln Financial, a different team, not the same team that you walked in here with. I'm done. Okay. We can move on now to the next topic. And this is basically just going to be a very roundtable conversation because we got about 10, 11 minutes left here on the sports arena. We are a quarter of the way through the season, gentlemen. And I'm just curious. We're not saying that this person or these individuals are definitely, definitively going to win these accolades, but I'm just curious where you gentlemen are at. Quarter of the way through the season. Who is your defensive player of the year? Right now, John DPO. Oh, John, go ahead, man. No, go ahead, Denzel. I'm still, uh, I still have some guys in mind. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I know that you know the, the, the Cowboys defense has just been flying all over the field, and Dan Quinn has done an excellent job with that defense in two years, and the universal answer or proverbial answer could be Michael Par Michael Parsons. But I'm going to go against the grain here. I'm going to say Khalil Mack of the Los Angeles Chargers. As it stands, he's got in four games, he's got 12 solo tackles. He's got five sacks and one forced fumble. He's been stepping it up in Bosa's absence. He's a, uh, he's a part of the, uh, what's supposed to, you know, get to be a, a bit of a vaunted defense. Uh, I know, yeah, they had the episode with Houston yesterday, but let that be only one episode, okay? As long as that offense gets it together, eventually they're going to be a force. But as of right now, 
Khalil Mack, he's my defensive player of the year. And considering the fact that, you know, he's already he's already got it. He made all pro uh as as an edge rush, as a defensive end and a linebacker. You know, as long as he stays healthy, I see the same old Mac. And we know what that guy represents. So DPOI so far, Khalil Mack. I'm actually going to take a page out of your book, and I'm thankful Mike's not here. But when he rewatches this video, him, our girl, Moment of Truth, Ruth K. Kias, and of course, our Queen of Hoops, Megan Price, when they see this, they're probably going to clip edit this and make sure they hang it up somewhere to remind me that I said this. But I will say he did come from Penn State. And right now, yes, if I had to pick a defensive player of the year, it is Micah Parsons. I know he plays for the Cowboys, and it just makes me nauseous even to think about that. But the fact of the matter is this. That young man is is is, a, is, is it, to say he's a stud is disrespectful because he's above that. He plays on such a high level, and he moves on both sides of the field. You always have to concern yourself where he is if you're in offense because if he gets through that line, your quarterback fitting to get hit. And so right now, quarter of the way through the season, he is my defensive player of the year. I would have to go with uh, Minka. I think Minka has just been absolutely terrific for, uh, for the Steelers. He's done everything for them. The back end of that defense, even with TJ Watt out, uh, Minka just continues to make plays. He's been fantastic all year for that defense. And Minka Fitzpatrick has to be my defensive player here so far. But, again, only four games. But he, he's been really, really good. All right. Shout out to our man, Jai Mizak, brother. We love seeing you. Can't wait to have you back, man. Thank God you're back. We will holler at you definitely soon. Yeah, man. thanks for joining night. us, bro. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, gentlemen. Now let's get to the last question. Right now, who is your MVP for this season? And I'm going to be totally biased when I say it. Yes, it is Jalen Hurts. Because all the question marks coming into this season about what he was incapable of doing in his first full season and then the four games that he played the previous season are now getting answered this season. Okay? So right now, if you ask me who is my season MVP, Jalen Hurts all day long. I'm going to let y'all go. (laughs) Go ahead, Johnny. All right. Uh, Uh, Mine would have to be, and this is, you know, you probably won't like this one because he's not a quarterback and nobody likes a non-quarterback MVP. Um, I would have to go with Nick Chubb, man. I mean, Nick Chubb leads the league in rushing. He's done absolutely everything for that offense. Without Nick Chubb, they would they wouldn't have a win. Like let's be honest. Like without Nick Chubb, they would they'd be dead in the water. They they just have to tread water until Deshaun Watson comes back in week thirteen against Denzel's Texans, which would be an interesting game, of course. But without Nick Chubb, I mean that team is completely lost. They they don't win any games, at least so far. Nick Chubb has just been absolutely fantastic for them week in and week out. Carrying the rock over 20 times a game. And that would be my MVP. It's just he's meant everything to that team. Without De- without Deshaun Watson, you got rid of Baker Mayfield. Like you had Jacoby Brissett, Brissett, who I think is terrible. Nick Chubb is is holding it down for them. Sweet. Um, I am going to have to go with Josh Allen. You know, um, I think it's a pretty much safe bet that if not this year, he's going to be an MVP sometime in the next two or three years. Uh, Now, I know the popular choice is probably Lamar Jackson, but they go by criteria. And as of right now, the criteria would be if the Ravens keep blowing games like this, it may prevent Lamar from winning a second MVP in as many years. But Josh Allen's got 1,227 passing yards in which Hurts only has seven less yards. He got 10 touchdown passes, three interceptions. He's holding a 101.0 passer rating. He's got 30 rushes for 183 and two touchdowns. You know, uh, you talk about a dude who I've told Bill's fans throughout, he's the best that you've had since Kelly. You know, um, a man who <clears throat> has has turned their – well, uh, their, uh, they've, they've had so long being a, the, a bottom franchise. And he's turned it around in just a few short years. And – 
even in the league with the Lamar Jacksons and the Justin Herberts and the Patrick Mahomes, in which anyone at any given time will win most valuable player, Josh Allen is hanging in there tough with them. You know, um, to me, he's a more mobile Ben. They're about the same size, you know, 6'5", 237, 240, you know. Um, I think he has uh, I think he has a slightly better arm than Ben did in his early days. I mean, the guy is unreal. I got to go with Josh Allen on this one. And he's a big crybaby. If you watch that play where he got the late oh, hit in that God. game, you man. know what, John? Throwing his really? temper tantrum, throwing really? his hands no. on the ground, throw, pointing really to the no. ref, crying like a—he just needs like a, a pacifier and some diapers. Turn him into like the, a baby man, because all he does is throw these temper tantrums. Okay, all right. See, John, I was gonna take the last three minutes, four minutes of the show tonight here, and actually give you a bunch of kudos. I really was. I had it all set and planned That's out. That's where you went wrong. And you decided to run your mouth and start talking just craziness, which I should be used to by now. We've been doing this for about two years, John. I should be used to you and your crazy talk. Yeah, you ever estimated me. But 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 you could you John, if there's one thing I will say, my brother, you never let me down. Thanks. You always bring me one. <laughs> but you know what? I'm still gonna do it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me give this man the solo screen and say this man for the last two weeks has been the Sports Arena Weekly Pick'em's champion. Yeah, not tonight, though. The Rams are getting their ass kicked, so I'm, I might lose this week if the Rams don't, uh, you know, come back. And unfortunately, I lose the time. Like, so, well, no, it'll be... They, yes, they tied me, and then they'll be. They'll be yeah. John, I tried. I, I, yeah, I did too, man. But, I mean, apparently Matt Safford forgot how to play football. And, um, <laughs> you know, but, but this doesn't count because, I mean, big guard, you know, I don't even see big guard anywhere. So, no, and big Mike guard, ain't no, here. So, really, we guard. could just crown me because they ain't even show up. Well, we got to give love. And see, I don't know how to do it in a tie. I just, I guess I'll put two crowns on. They tied for the week if that's what happens. Co MVP. Co MVP. Co MVPs. Yeah. Co winners. I guess so. They're like we'll Bret Hart and Luger. We'll they both won the Royal Rumble. <laughs> oh, no. We ain't doing that. Ain't nothing like that. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> we'll, we'll, put them two in a, we'll put them two in a cage match. Let them fight it out. No Man, way I out. I pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Karen Tenuto and Ty and Big Guard. Yes. Oh, listen, I love Mike. He might talk I you to swear, death, but Big Guard. I swear, if you knocking. throw Ray Lynn in there for a triple threat match, oh, man, God, forget about it. Forget about it. Ray, <laughs> Ray will just said Ray will just wait for one of them to beat the other one up, and then Ray will get the victory. We are and pick the bones. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's it. That's what he'll do. You just Please. do that roll up pin. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for us here tonight on the Sports Arena. We'll be back on Wednesday night. Oh. So much football to talk about. So much to get into. We do have the Thursday night matchup, which, I mean, is it really even a contest? Just, I mean, I don't know. Russ versus Ryan. Yeah. Well, the Colts are the Colts are a bit unpredictable, and the 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 Broncos are still trying to figure their offense out. I've got it as a toss up game over here as of now. We'll make our decisions on Wednesday night. Here's the one thing I will tell you. At the end of that match, though, on Thursday night, a horse will win. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, for everybody at the Sideline Sports Network and for the entire crew, for our man Ray Lynn, Ty Ray, Mike Harris Nudo, Megan Price, John Shear, your man Eric Wilson, everybody at uh, the Gauntlet, shout out to uh, Philly Jim, Tatum, shout out to my man Denzel, yes, Dom. JJ, that whole entire crew over there. Make sure you check them out. You guys have a new a new night now. Friday nights, 8 p.m. You transition. Friday night Friday. lights. You say, yeah, Friday night lights. Make sure you check them out. We will talk to y'all on Wednesday. Everybody stay safe. Be blessed. Peace. <laughs>